Uh, the change was unmistakable. Everywhere, among all people, there is a search for something hidden, for some realization which will give greater knowledge, greater vision, greater understanding, and this the people call truth. They think that truth lies hidden in some distant place, away from life, away from joy, away from sorrow. But truth is life itself. And with an understanding of life, there is born an understanding of truth. While traveling, a sudden hemorrhage brought back fears for Nietzsche's health. He was weak in high fever and racked with coughing. It was decided that the brothers should again return to the dry climate of the Ojai Valley. Once in California, Nietzsche seemed to improve, and when Mrs. Besant cabled asking that Krishnamurti come to India for Theosophy's Jubilee Convention, he reluctantly agreed. The bond between the brothers had grown stronger than ever. There was unquestioning faith that Nietzsche was essential to the work ahead, and because of this, his life would be spared. While en route, a cable arrived saying that Nietzsche had influenza. A later wire read, flu rather more serious. Pray for me. On the 13th of November, as the ship entered the Suez Canal, a telegram arrived announcing Nietzsche's death. The news broke Krishnamurti completely. It did more. His entire philosophy of life, the implicit faith in the future, and Nietzsche's vital part in it all, appeared to be shattered at that moment. An old dream is dead, and a new one is being born. A new vision is coming into being, and a new consciousness is being unfolded. I know now with greater certainty than ever before that there is real beauty in life, real happiness that cannot be shattered by any physical happening, a great strength which cannot be weakened by any passing events, and a great love which is permanent, imperishable, and unconquerable. By the time he reached Madras, his face was quiet and radiant. The Jubilee Convention of 1925 celebrated 50 years in the life of the Theosophical Society. Thousands attended the four-day gatherings, and events were eagerly reported by newspapers around the world. A Star Congress followed the convention. By this time, the Order of the Star had grown to over 45,000 members. Under the branches of Adya's enormous banyan tree, Krishnamurti spoke of the world teacher. His face was powerful and stern in the twilight, his eyes half veiled as if looking inward. As he spoke, a deep silence spread through the audience. Some felt they saw a light envelop him, and many believed they were in the presence of the Messiah himself. The young man was becoming the focus of deep divisions. While thousands accepted him as the world teacher, others were disturbed by the adoration and attention given him. In the Netherlands some years earlier, the Baron Philip van Palant had given his ancestral home, the Castle Erde, to the Order of the Star. 5,000 wooded acres surrounded the 18th century buildings. The castle had been transformed into a meeting place where small groups gathered yearly. The change that was taking place in Krishnamurti was to intensify the following week at the Omen Star Camp of 1926. Close to the castle Erde, 
the Omen camp attracted over 2,000 people of every nationality. There were huge tents for meetings and for meals. Lectures were given, and every evening Krishnamurti lit a bonfire and spoke to the gathering. In order to be happy, need we have religions? In order to love, need we build temples? Truth cannot be found in the dark sanctuary of temples, nor in the well-lit halls of organized societies. Neither can it be found in books, nor in ceremonies. Go down to the sea where the breezes are blowing and the waves are breaking over each other. You want to gather and bind all that beauty into a narrow temple. Do not allow your mind or your heart to be bound by anything or anyone. If you do, you will establish another religion, another temple. You must not create little gods and worship at little shrines. Who wants to worship by the light of one candle when you can have the sun? It was increasingly difficult to reconcile Krishnamurti's vision of truth with the forms and structures not only of theosophy, but all organized religions. His rejection of spiritual authority was a threat to the society and its lifelong members. There was open hostility as the organization seemed to be pulling apart. Lines were drawn as some stood firmly with him while others clung to their cherished beliefs. Lady Emily Lettyens, who had been close to Krishnamurti since 1911, shared the bewilderment that many felt. How strange it seems, she said, that for 17 years we have expected a world teacher, and now when he speaks, we are hurt or angry. He is making us do our own work, and that is the last thing we expected of him. In May of 1928, the first Ojai Star Camp was held under the evergreen oak trees of Southern California. But with each new talk, each meeting, the divisions became more apparent. In failing health, Annie Besant was forced to cancel her public engagements. Yet she still tried desperately to reconcile theosophy with what Krishnamurti was saying. She quoted ancient Hindu scriptures saying, all paths lead to the same spiritual goal. But in spite of her efforts, the divisions widened. There were no gentle platitudes. There was to be no uniting of existing religions. Ceremonies and organized religions, he said, were a hindrance, a distraction from the truth. He offered no method. There were no steps to follow, no system that ensured spiritual progress. His vision of truth was absolute. In the Netherlands on August 3rd, 1929, at the Omen Gathering, in the presence of Mrs. Besant and over 3,000 star members, Krishnamurti dissolved the Order of the Star freeing himself from all claims made for him. I maintain that truth is a pathless land and you cannot approach it by any path whatsoever, by any religion, by any sect. That is my point of view and I adhere to that absolutely and unconditionally. Truth, being limitless, unconditioned, is unapproachable by any path whatsoever. It cannot be organized, nor should any organization be formed to lead or coerce people along any particular path. If an organization be created for this purpose, it becomes a crutch a weakness, a bondage, and must cripple the individual and prevent him from the discovery of that absolute, unconditioned truth. 
you can form other organizations